Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here so late this evening. And I promise you, I won't keep you all for too long from your uh, dinner plans. So today, what we want to talk about is how you can use your anomaly detection uh, methods and enhance them to impact mean time to respond. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So we'll take a quick moment to introduce ourselves. Um, if any of you attended my talk yesterday, um, you'll remember me. I'm Kritika. Um, I'm a machine learning engineer at Apple, and I work in the observability team. My background is in observability, machine learning, and data science. Um, Prashita? Hi, I'm Prashita. I'm an engineering manager at Apple. I lead our observability intelligence and analysis team. And my background is in observability, machine learning, data science, and data engineering. All righty. So um, let's do a quick walkthrough of our um, agenda for today. So we're going to start with a case study, um, talk about what is the problem with delayed detection, and then how anomaly detection can help with that and reduce mean time to detect. And then we'll jump into um, a, you know, a little more advanced uh, anomaly detection methods that can help with root cause detection and how that reduces MTTR. And finally, we'll jump into some questions. Okay, so for most of us here, when we say anomaly detection, we automatically associate that with mean time to detect. However, you can enhance your anomaly detection methods and add some contextual information to it to get a lot more insights from anomaly detection. And so the core focus of our talk today is going to be how you can leverage real-time anomaly detection methods to not just improve mean time to detect, but also improve mean time to resolve. Um, some of the key takeaways we hope you'll get today is we'll talk a little bit about value proposition of anomaly detection, talk about some of the statistical and machine learning methods that are out there for anomaly detection, and then jump into the important part, which is how can you improve mean time to resolve with anomaly detection, and also talk about how you can leverage some of the open source um, frameworks and tools to build your anomaly detection pipeline. So with that, Prashita, do you want to take away with our yes. use case? Thank you, Kritika. All right, so we'll start by setting up some context for our case study. Imagine that you're creating your very first online service, which is an astronomy shop. Sounds really cool. It is, it is every space explorer's dream. It's full of all these fancy gadgets like telescopes and binoculars. We're also offering like a flat discount, so get them while supplies last. What do you want as a service owner? You wanna make sure that your customers are loyal so they keep coming back. You want to grow your business and you also want to make sure that your users have a stellar experience. That's why we call it Stellar Stash. Now, how do you go about doing this? At the end of the day, this is an online service, right? So you wanna make sure high availability, reliability, and good user experience. And you do this by setting up SLAs. What are SLAs? SLAs are service level agreements. In this case, they could be that 95% of the transactions in this online store need to be processed within two seconds. At least 2,000 requests need to go through every second, or less than 1% of the requests should fail. What you're going to do is track these SLAs by linking them to key performance indicators. In this case, these directly translate to request latency, throughput, and failure rate. And then you track your KPIs and SLAs to ensure that there is no degradation in the service and there continues to be good user experience. So how, are, how do you go about doing this? What you can do is you can instrument your service using uh, collecting the KPI metrics and store them in Prometheus and put them up on a dashboard. And you can watch this dashboard to ensure that there is no degradation of the service. But how long are you gonna do that? You have to get back to selling, so this doesn't really scale. Moreover, what if your users grow? So now you have tens of millions of users. What if you want to add further sub-services to your service? So in this case, we want to add tutorials for you know, budding astronomers or people on how to use these fancy telescopes. Uh, you just can't keep watching tens of thousands of dashboards or metrics day in and day out. That just doesn't scale. Also, before I move on, for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans in here, there's like two Easter eggs. Those last two tutorials on the right are taught by Marvin. So essentially, you can't scale this approach. Let's talk a little bit about the problems that you're going to run into. The first is longer detection time. Longer detection time is going to lead to missed SLAs, which is going to erode the trust that you users have in you. 
it is going to lead to increased downtime, which is essentially going to lead to unavailability of your service from time to time. When you have issues like longer detection time, missed SLAs, all of this snowballs into compounding system failures, and you're going to spend all your time either firefighting, manually inter intervening, further leading to higher operational costs, and overall a degraded user experience where, going to, where you're going to lose trust with your users and also potentially take a revenue hit. So not that stellar an experience for Stellar Stash. What we're trying to do here is to solve this problem, essentially SLA breach detection. So you want to track your KPIs. Whenever there is abnormal behavior in these KPIs, that leads to either service degradation or SLA breaches, you want to identify that. You want to figure out what the root cause of this was, fix the issue, and bring the service back up. All right, now that we know what we want to do, how do you do it? The answer is anomaly detection. What is anomaly detection? It is a technique used in data analysis to identify data points, events, or observations that deviate from expected or normal behavior of a system. So what you're doing is you're using proactive and real-time monitoring to ensure reliability and scalability of your system and service. You're reducing your mean time to detect to improve your user experience. You are discovering hidden performance opportunities that are leading to improved service availabilities. And finally, another value proposition that anomaly detection adds it, it adjusts to data drifts to adapt to future growth for your service. Okay, now let's go back to an example that is connected to your astronomy online storefront. Um, imagine you have a SLA where you are saying that uh, at least 95% of the users should have a latency less than two, two seconds. For this, you are tracking the KPI, which is the latency. You see that there is a sudden spike in your KPI. You can detect this using anomaly detection, so you can quickly identify this behavior send off a notification and alert, which would significantly reduce your mean time to detect compared to the manual approach because you couldn't have been necessarily staring at the dashboard at the right time to catch this. So anomaly detection is basically helping you proactively monitor acro anomalies across all your key performance metrics to help address potential issues and ensure a great user experience. All right, so now let's talk about what an end-to-end -end workflow for anomaly detection would look like. It starts off with instrumentation and collection, because we have to collect metrics. Uh, then you need to store this data, so that's the storage layer. You have to analyze, because that's where anomaly detection comes in. You have to visualize this, because that really helps you derive insights and connect the dots. And then finally, you have to alert and notify, because that is very crucial to reducing your mean time to detect. Let's delve deeper into some of these steps. The first is instrumentation and collection. Um, there are various uh, open source libraries, like of course open telemetry, that can be used with SDKs in Python and Go to essentially instrument your service, so in this case the astronomy storefront, the KPIs that you care about, and collect them. The next layer we have here is storage. You of course want to store these KPIs to be able to monitor them. For this you can use you know, various storage solutions like Prometheus, or Thanos and Cortex, which provide high availability, multi-tenancy, long-term, and persistent storage. And then comes analysis. This is where we do anomaly detection. There are various libraries across multiple languages that are available to do both statistical and machine learning anomaly detection. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But you can use libraries and frameworks like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn to do this. You can also use frameworks like Kubeflow and KServ to actually train your models and deploy them. Kubeflow comes out of the box with a lot of features like distributed training, experiment tracking, hyperparameter tuning, and integration with CPUs and GPUs. And then KFServe comes integrated with Kubeflow to actually be able to serve these models in production. Before we go into the rest of the workflow, let's zoom in a little bit into the anomaly detection and the modeling layer. Um, as mentioned earlier, there are multiple models that we can use. We'll focus here on the statistical models. Kritika will talk a little bit more about the machine learning models. There are various options for this. Z-score, ARIMA, STL decomposition. And then based on certain conditions, some are better than the others. So with the online astronomy storefront, Z-score is good because of its versatility. Um, when you want data smoothing, you can use Holtminter's method because that helps and works with those use cases. It's also available out of the box with Prometheus. 
What's great about these models are that they're lightweight, scalable, and offer uh, training-free anomaly detection. So you essentially don't have to have pre-training data available. Um, they can perform real-time analysis with minimal setup, are fast, and generalize well across data types. They are also good at quickly identifying threshold violations, handling unknown environments, and then even working, like I said, with limited historical data. And finally, they have less operation costs. Machine learning models requires building training pipelines, service pipelines, production environments. All of that is often not a cost-effective choice for a lot of anomaly detection use cases. Um, very quickly, uh, like I said, lots of libraries across various languages. If you want to use Python, we have Starts Model, SciPy, TensorFlow time series analysis, which come with a lot of handy um, functions for time series analysis. In Go, we have GoNum, Stats, uh, Stream Tools. Prometheus, fortunately, right out of the box, comes with a lot of functions that enable time series analysis and anomaly detection. So you have predict linear, you have standard deviation over time, which can be used with Z-score. You have whole printers, which, like I said, is often used and is like a very good um, uh, library to go with. All right, now we come back to our workflow. Once we have completed analysis, so anomaly detection, we get back to visualization. Like I said, visualization is key to deriving the most actionable insights from the anomalies. You can use various open source plugins and toolkits for this, like Dashboard from Elasticsearch and Persis, to create custom dashboards and representations that are tailored to specific needs. And then finally, like I said earlier, alerting and notification is key because if you are not able to alert on time, it will not significantly reduce your mean time to detect. Um, these can be configured using tools like Alert Manager, which uh, helps you manage alerts, create custom notification policies, and work with various preferred communication uh, channels. Okay. So now let's come back and tie together the value proposition for anomaly detection, especially in the context of observability and with respect to our astronomy online store. What we did here was we leveraged anomaly detection to generate data-driven insights to detect our regressions in a faster or quicker manner. This effectively reduced the downtime of our service, thereby essentially reducing the mean time to detect. This also helped us improve our operational efficiency, maintained our SLAs, and enhanced customer experience, leading to a stellar ex experience on Stellar Stash. Try saying that 10 times in a row. We should have picked better words. Uh, <laughs> I will now pass it on to Kritika, who will talk about how anomaly detection can impact MTTR. All right. Um, thank you, Prashita. So, so far, uh, we've looked at how anomaly detection uh, methods can be used to perform to find anomalous behaviors in single metrics and you know find performance issues and this approach is great because you're just using one metric right that is easy interpretation of the results but it comes with it, its own downsides so because you're using only one metric to perform anomaly detection it has limited context of the um, system that you have at hand and because of that it is not really indicative of service degradation Okay, so while univariate analysis um, focuses on a single KPI, uh, multivariate anomaly detection allows you to analyze uh, anomalies across all of your KPIs at once or maybe some combination of them. Essentially, um, it lets you perform anomaly detection on multiple metrics at the same time. And because you're using multiple metrics at the same time, you have more contextual information about the system itself because using multiple metrics gives you more information. And from the correlate, correlations that you can generate from these metrics, you get a better indication of when a service is degrading or there is a potential issue. So at a very high level, multivariate anomaly detection utilizes the correlations and relationships between your key KPIs that you've defined like we've defined here and uses this to get deeper insights to detect how the combined degradation of these metrics can indicate a broader system performance issue. So let's now go back to our astronomy shop use case and take a very simple example here to um, understand how multivariate anomaly detection helps. So imagine that you know one morning you woke up and you saw that there are a lot more people who are jumping online onto your store and they're buying more telescopes and binoculars. 
but that was also followed by an increase in the request latency and the failure rate. So univariate anomaly detection can only help you say that there is some abnormal behavior in each of these individual metrics and that there's some performance issue. But with multivariate anomaly detection, the model is capable of identifying correlations between our metrics that we have here, which is um, number of active users, request latency, and uh, the failure rate. And because of all this added, uh, it uses all of this added contextual information to say that there is some anomalous behavior happening. And so now what you can do is set up alerts on all of these metrics to only notify if and only if multiple of these metrics fire at the same time. So this way you can reduce the number of false positives that you get and also ensure that you kind of get a general idea of the overall system performance as a whole. And if there's a degradation, you get to know that too. Um, okay, so let's um, you know, dive a little deeper into ML models that can be used for multivariate analysis. There are actually a plethora of models that you can use for multivariate analysis, but we have highlighted here uh, models that are very relevant for the use case that we are trying to solve, which is SLAB. So the first one is the autoencoder method. Autoencoders are great at highlighting um, and com uh, compressing high dimensional data and filtering out the noise from them. Once they've filtered out the noise, they reconstruct this high dimensional data and compare the reconstructed data to the actual metric. Depending on what the reconstruction error is between these two uh, data points, it says whether the point is anomalous or not. The next one is LSTMs. We all have heard of LSTMs in some uh, way or the other, I hope. So LSTMs are essentially memory cells, and they have a memory of um, historical trends of the metrics that you feed into them. And using these historical trends, they predict the next timestamp for that metric and compare that next timestamp to the actual metric to see if there is a larger prediction error. If there's a larger prediction error, that is an anomaly. And finally, let's talk about graph neural networks. This is actually a very important method for what we're talking about, the astronomy shop, because the astronomy shop is actually a microservice uh, we are, that we are running. We are running. So the uh, graph, graph neural networks can actually help with understanding component level relationships because it maps the components and the metrics to individual nodes of a graph and uses that graph to understand the relationship. And using these relationships, it can predict the next timestamp, compare that to the actual value, and say that there's an anomaly. Um, here are some open source tools and frameworks that you can use to uh, get uh, you know, multivariate anomaly detection or any other uh, anomaly detection models uh, to use. If you guys want to take a quick photo, I'm going to just leave it up for a second and then move on. All right, moving on. OK. So let's come back to that univariate anomaly detection workflow that Prashita was talking about. And let's see how we need to modify this for multivariate anomaly detection. There's really not that much modification that's needed. You only have to expand the analysis layer to also include correlation along with anomaly detection. So correlation helps you uh, understand metric level relationship while dependency graphs helps you understand service level relationship. Now there's a new word there, dependency graphs. We're gonna talk about that, but before we get there, we're gonna dive into this analysis layer a little bit. Okay, so what if I told you that you can extend that uh, multivariate anomaly detection setup that we had to perform root cause identification? Are you intrigued? So before we get there, we're going to go back to the example and look at, um, how, look at what we mean by root cause identification. OK, so again, let's simplify the example here a little bit. Let's take that same setup where there was an increase in the number of users, the request latency, and the failure rate. This specific combination of metric degradations could indicate very specific potential issue or issues. In this case, it could be indicative of a resource bottleneck. So multivariate anomaly detection can actually inform you of this resource bottleneck issue that we have at hand. And with, with this root cause identification, you can target your troubleshooting efforts to very specific causes that have been outlined. So you just improve the speed at which you resolve the issue. All right. So let's come back to that multivariate setup and let's look at what needs to change for us to adapt this to a root cause uh, identification problem. Again, there's really not much of a change. All you need to do is change your output layer for anomaly detection to emit potential root causes, 
detected of anomalies. And with this, you get multi-level root cause uh, identification. So what if you want to extend this setup to also get component level or microservice level uh, uh, root cause identification? You just have to introduce a dependency graph as context for your anomaly detection method. And along with the correlation, it can detect component level root cause identification. So let's come back to that word, dependency graph. Dependency graph is nothing but a representation of how uh, different components or microservices relate to one another, how they interact with one another. And it's actually very easy to build a dependency graph. All you need is the API calls that happen between the microservices or the data flows that happen uh, within the components, and you can generate a dependency graph for your service or microservices. That's pretty cool, right? All right. So now let's go back to the larger picture and address the premise that we originally set out to solve, which is mean time to resolve. So we have now leveraged anomaly detection to perform root cause identification, and this provides a great initial triage step because you get a list of possible root causes. So you can, so you can use those possible root causes in your analysis layer and very quickly get to a resolution. Let's say you've encountered a simple, you know, perhaps even a known issue, something that you've seen before. You can actually even automate that root cause analysis layer and uh, resolution layer. So um, if you like tie it back to the astronomy use case that we had where we were looking at the resource bottlenecks, um, maybe you built a very cool automated log analysis setup along, uh, along with your observability stack. So your log analysis setup told you that the root cause was just that your CPU capacity was not enough to handle the load. And all you have to do is increase the CPU capacity and you'll be great to go. So this you can actually automate. But maybe you have more complex issues where even the initial uh, uh, triage that the root cause identification step gives you is, is root causes that need more manual uh, analysis. In this case, the individual who's performing these analysis, this analysis can use the shorter list of uh, potential root causes that you provided to analyze and identify the issue quickly and fix the issue very quickly. Okay, so now let's go back to what the value proposition for multivariate anomaly detection is and like focus in on the initial uh, root cause analysis identification that uh, we, uh, we spoke about. So with this, the overall manual oversight that you need to identify an issue and fix it is lowered because you already have a few uh, possible root causes given to you which you can look at. And because of the holistic view of the system health that you get, um, it, it can help you focus your energies on analyzing very specific um, causes, root causes, instead of you trying to go and look for a needle in a haystack. And overall, it helps you improve your mean time to respond. Now we need to tie all this back to mean time to resolve. So let's quickly take a look at what comprises mean time to resolve. It includes mean time to detect, mean time to acknowledge, mean time to respond, mean time to repair, and mean time to resolve. While we cannot impact all of the components that are shown here, by enhancing anomaly detection to include root cause identification, you can impact both mean time to detect and mean time to respond and possibly reduce that um, as much as possible because you've now given some very specific uh, root causes to look at. So with this cumulative re reduction in time across mean time to detect and mean time to respond, even your overall mean time to resolve also you know, improves and it comes down. All right, so as promised, uh, we spoke about the value proposition of anomaly detection spoke about some of the statistical methods and machine learning methods that you can use for anomaly detection, talked about how you can improve mean time to resolve by enhancing your anomaly detection methods for, to indicate root causes. And finally, we also spoke about how you can leverage open source frameworks and tools like Kubeflow and KFServe and everything to build your anomaly detection pipeline. So today we've explored you know, leveraging anomaly detection for SLA breach detection and uh, root cause detection. We just want to say that you know, we are not being very prescriptive here. This is just one of the ways that you can implement root cause detection and SLA, detect, uh, SLA breach detection using um, the anomaly uh, detection methods that we showed. So we hope that um, this talk was helpful for you.
and it sparked some new ideas on how you can use root cause identification for all your future projects. Thank you for being here so late. Um, now we'll open it up to questions. Hey, uh, so this looks very good. Is there a very dumbed down version that I can like do a setup, like a test setup for my um, for my environment? Sorry, can you repeat your question? Like, yeah. Is there a dumbed down version of actually doing the installations, like use Kubeflow and then do this, then do this plugin kind of thing, like a demo kind of thing or VOC kind of thing that we can actually follow? Um, maybe we should just talk because we're not able to hear you. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah we're Sorry, just talking. We're not able if to you hear can, your can just come we'll up. Sorry about that. We're not able to hear what you're saying. Um, so your question is if you. Uh, Um, so the question is, uh, is there a readme that you can, uh, you can use to um, set up the same thing that we spoke about here uh, for any of your use cases? Um, right now, there's technically no readme. This is just for you to like understand what is really out there and what you can really use for um, uh, your anomaly detection and root cause identification problems. Um, there are, there's also a lot more that you can do with um, you know, even lo adding logs into the mix, you know, getting root cause analysis and all of that. So, is, um, you you will have to explore it a little bit on your own, but we can help give you some ideas maybe. But that's a that's a good piece of feedback we could take back yeah. to work on and and have something in the works. Can you can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, have you noticed that you have to like? Uh, is there a lot of tuning involved after selecting a model? Do you after implement it? Do you have to do a lot of tuning? Um, it depends on uh, what kind of model you pick. So mm -hmm. it's very, oh, sorry, um, I was supposed to repeat the question. So the question is, is there a lot of tuning that is um, involved in trying to use machine learning for anomaly detection? Um, it depends, again, what model you pick. So you can actually pick some existing pre-trained models and you know use that to uh, tune just whatever is needed and go with that for uh, your anomaly detection needs. But over time, you will need to tune your models because there will be some data drift. It, the, data ch the data patterns change as time goes on, so you will have to tune it. How, how would you know that you picked the wrong model? Uh, the, uh, you can like compare the, uh, uh, what do you call it, prediction errors between what is being predicted and what the actual value is. Usually, that ends up being very high if you've picked the wrong model. Gotcha. Even when you scale, that's another time when you have to tune the models because anomaly detection models are just traditionally hard to scale across a diverse set of use cases. So in both those cases, you have to do that. And like Kritika said, identify you know what the error has increased and make changes based on that. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Um, I had a similar question to um, the one that the gentleman asked uh, earlier. Uh, I know you kind of broke it up into different um, kind of steps and uh, explained the platforms relevant for each of those steps. But is there a way, or is there a platform, or is there a product that kind of combines uh, some of these to a degree so that I don't have to build it all myself? Um, um, there are some vendor solutions that you can use. Oh, sorry, the question was, are there, is there a platform that integrates all of this into um, one single uh, pipeline. Um, there are some vendor solutions that you can use uh, to get anomaly detection out of the box. And like Prashita said, right, uh, there's, Prometheus has a lot of uh, uh, what do you say, functions that you can use out of the box, and you don't actually have to go and set up all of this um, pipeline to get anomaly detection. So you can use Prometheus, you can use some of the open source uh, tool, uh, libraries that are there in Python and go for yeah, but it up. our key takeaway is to try to work on making something available, so we'll <laughs> do that. Of course, uh, you know, open source. Yes. Uh, when you make the jump from anomaly detection to root cause prediction, is your assumption there that you have uh, labeled training data, or how do, how do you actually generate those predictions? That is a great question. So the question was, are you assuming that there's uh, labeled training data for all of this to use the machine learning models? So. 
Um, the LSTM models that we spoke about, those actually do require labeled, uh, required labeled training data, but the other models actually can work with uh, unlabeled data too. Autoencoders actually specialize in unlabeled data, so you can use that for unlabeled data. Yeah, and nowadays you can also utilize a lot of semi-supervised approaches where you have like a very limited amount of labeled data because it does in certain situations really increase your accuracy. So there's like a wide variety of options available from like what Kritika said, unsupervised to semi-supervised, where you can tailor it to what you have available. Thank you. Hello, great okay. presentation. Uh, how did you build a dependency graph or topology? And which open source tool did you use? Also another question. Where do you store this graph? Uh, so your first question is how did we build the dependency graph? Yeah. So um, you can build dependency graphs uh, depending on what kind of a service you have. If you have a service that just a single service that has all the components within itself, you can use the data flow to build your depend dependency graph. And if you have a microservice setup, then you can use the API calls they make to each other, uh, track them, and actually build your dependency graph based on that. Um, okay. I didn't follow the next part of your question. Uh, where do you store the Where graphs? do you store them? Yeah, store. Um, that's a good question. You can actually store them, uh, you know, in any um, SQL database um, or Postgres, uh, any database, any. Yeah. If you want to store it as a graph, there are storage options. Options for, for that too. For graph. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of open source options for that as well. Thank you. Would you be able to share an example of how you've used this in practice? Like, the theory is nice, but I don't know if you can give some maybe more concrete example. Um, the question is, how do you use this in practice? Rashita, do you want to take that? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, um, do you, are you looking for a specific example? Sorry, uh, we did repeat the question, right? Yes. Okay. Are you looking for a specific example? Yeah, I am curious about you know how your practical experience using this and you know kind of the results that you guys have gotten and so forth. So uh, yeah, we don't want to talk about like Kritika said, we don't want to be prescriptive about any specific service. Um, but uh, going back to if you look at your astronomy store, it is a service, right? You have a service, then there's multiple microservices. So anytime you scale that out to a larger setup, you have services, microservices, you identify individual uh, you know, anomalies in, in these metrics and then you connect them. There are a couple of things like the dependency graph, you do need some sort of domain expertise at times, that's the uh, sort of stuff Kritika went into. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could extrapolate that to a service. Uh, Thanks. And, and have you guys used any of these like automated uh, remediations in, in practice? Um, I don't think we can talk about that. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to like, uh, we want to focus here on what's available open source and, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, happy to chat. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do, <clears throat> sorry, uh, do, uh, do you have, a, uh, sorry, uh, do we have any ideas uh, to choose correct uh, features to input your machine language model. For example, so I think, so you guys are input, uh, using uh, uh, SLI related features, like response time or so. And in addition, so, so in case of me, so I'm using so resource data such as CPU or memory or so. Maybe we can chat with you again, we are not able to do so. Yeah, something is off of the mic, mic we yeah. are not able to. Uh, sorry, uh, so simply my, uh, my question is, so, uh, so, so please give me ideas to choose features to input uh, into your machine language model. Yes, yes, yes. For features example, for CPU reason. or response time. What is a specific features for response time? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, hmm? uh, for example, response time or CPU usage rate or memory usage. I think you are using those kind of. Yeah, quantities. How do you identify the features yes, to yes. Uh, reduce response time? Yes, effective. Yeah. Uh, so, in, so from my experiences, so sometimes, so so 
So for example, golden signals in the SRA book does not work well. And in this sense, do you have any idea to choose good features? Yeah. So I'm actually going to give you a very machine learning uh, response to that. You can actually feed all of the metrics that you have as features to your model. And really, the modern uh, machine learning, deep learning models we have are very great at identifying uh, good features from the lot of features that you feed. But if you want um, specific methods that help you just pick out what are the important features, autoencoders is one of them that can do that because it does that dimensionality reduction from high dimensional data, right? So that low dimensional data that you can get, that you can use as features to feed it into your uh, model. There are also uh, statistical methods like uh, uh, PCA, which you can use, principal component analysis, which you can use for uh, uh, extracting. Uh, uh, and the non-machine learning answer is like, go with the metrics that you see are have a high signal to noise ratio. Uh, yeah, right? okay. so uh, if you uh, yeah. have expertise on your system, the obvious ones would. Uh, yeah, okay. In addition to so much in this technique like so autoencoder, so, so using so classical classical techniques such as, such as PCA, uh, so 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 could work. Uh, yeah, then I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. We we'd also like to chat offline because yeah. uh, sorry, there's a lot of audio issues. Yeah. But All right. Thank I, you for I, the question. Yeah, it's okay. So I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.